Welcome back to a Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes, and today we have two very special guests. Uh, my co-commentator is Colin Watt, and we have European Cup winner Paul Lambert and Simon Donnelly, both men who stopped the 10. How are you doing, guys? Yeah, very good. Yeah, all good. Very really good, yeah, fine. I've been posting about that this week, and um, I, I find it incredible that it's been 25 years, Paul Lambert. That time doesn't come by itself, does it? I mean, you, you must feel a wee bit uh, older. Obviously, Simon's got the Gregory Pecks on. Um, how, how are you feeling yourself, Paul? You in good health? Touch wood, yeah. I think that's the most important aspect for anybody is, is as long as you're healthy that's that's the most thing but you're right the 25 years thing is is um it's a great thing time waits for nobody and, it, and it's and it catches you and, you and it will you can never beat it and 25 years is a, a hell of a long time but it was a monumental thing just my i don't know simon's opinion but my time was the uh, i think that created a legacy for Celtic to really kick on because it stopped that 10 in a row and it protected the the Lions history and, and what the club stood for. So, and Simon will tell you, that Rangers team, I think, or that Rangers era was probably the strongest era that I'd played against in an in, in old firm rivalry. You know, when I look at that, Simon, on that point that Paul's making there, I started going to the games in 1987-88 and we win the double that year and I'm thinking, this is great, this is, this is what it's like to be a Celtic supporter, but then I need to wait until the season that we're going to be talking about today to see another league win. Uh, you came in kind of in the middle of all that, you know, breaking into yeah. the side um, as well. And, you know, prior to Paul's arrival, prior to Vim Janssen's arrival, did you have a belief that, you know, maybe Tommy Burns would have brought the title to Celtic? Did you think he was building something special? Yeah, I think just what Lambo's touching on there, obviously, about his preserving the Lisbon Lions nine in a row, but I, th I think it did start with, with the TB coming back to the club. Uh, I signed in 92, and again, as Lambo touches on there, a period where Rangers were really, really strong, uh, and we suffered because of that, you know, but I was there at the start of Tommy coming back to the club and bringing in some real quality players from abroad that helped the guys that were already there. And there was signs of us getting closer, you know, that run more so than I think 95, 96, and we only get beat once. Ultimately, too many draws, you know, uh, didn't get us over the line. And then just round the corner, you know, after Tommy Vim stepped in and, you know, the rest is history. But that, I think, was the start. And when, from my personal point of view, seeing guys like Pierre come into the club, Andy, Tom, Cadet, the Canio, it, it lifted us to a place where we did see ourselves getting closer to the Rangers. Uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah, it, it gave you hope. It did give you hope. But as I say, when, when Vim came in in 97, 98, you know, it's an incredible story, really, because this guy here included, but there were so many new guys came through the door for us yeah. to click so quickly and, and, and win that league. It's, it is an incredible story. Yeah, it definitely is. Yeah, so I was just going to ask, obviously, you spoke about the Tommy Burns side and obviously if you ask a lot of um, Celtic fans from that era, they'll say it's the greatest football they've seen Celtic play ever. It was just attacking football. It was the Celtic way. What was the yeah. difference between that side and the side that Wim brought in? What was the difference between the two coaching methods that eventually made Wim the guy that brought home the title and stopped the 10? It's a great question. It, is, it really is a great question because I enjoyed to play on both sides. There's some real talent on both sides. Uh, I think maybe there was more of a solid look about us in 97, 98. He brought in some defenders there. As I say, Lambo came in. Lambo and Craig Burley in the middle of the park that season were phenomenal. You know, they really complemented each other. Burley breaking into the box. I think Butler must have got about 15, 16 goals. Uh, and it, we just seemed to click. We obviously had the guy up front that mm. came in and made such a huge difference for us. But we did. We, we seemed to gel. It's a, it is a really good question because I look back to 95, 96. A lot of good players as well. Mm. But I think just too many draws. And now when it pops up on your Twitter 25, 25 years ago on this day and I watch some of the games back, the late goals, the important goals that we scored, it just seemed to all clicking place in 97, 98. 
You know, when we're looking at it as, as fans, Paul, uh, it was a massive thing for us because it was stopping the 10. Some fans don't like calling it that. They like saying it was winning the one. But we were stopping that 10 in a row. Uh, the, the campaign started off with yourself in Germany. Um, Rangers spent £14.5 million pound that pre-season. So when it was pitched to you that there was a potential move to Celtic on the cards, um, was it pitched to you that you were coming in to, as Simon says, be one of the building blocks to to prevent that from happening? Was that the sole focus of the campaign or did you think it might have taken a season or two? I think you'd have to be born in the moon not to realise the pressure Celtic were under at that time because they tend to row. That, that never phased me. The, 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 Simon's obviously here longer, so he... They last would know what it was like with Rangers dominance of Rangers every time, every year, every year, winning and winning. So the, the, the fear factor was never there for me. I knew the size of the club and knew the, a little bit about it and just knowing some of the lads from the Scotland the national team. But um, yeah, Vim, yeah, listen, Vim gave me a ch- he gave me a chat up in Aberdeen when I was playing with Scott and asked would I come to Celtic. And the first few times I said no um, because I was happy in Dortmund. Everything was good. I could have went anywhere at that time. But I always say to Dortmund, no, I, I really enjoy it here. And then things transpired uh, on different things. And then he, he tried it again. Uh, and I think, I think I think I signed in the November time, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, uh, I've got to be totally honest, I was terrible the first few games. I was absolutely horrendous. Couldn't get a grip of it. And then um, and uh, I thought, no, I need, I need to, I need to try and get the emotion for Dortmund away, and then and concentrate on Celtic because that was that was playing in my head. And uh, it wasn't until after we, we played Dundee United, Simon. Remember in the cup final, and uh, yep. the, the lads went went on and won it. And I remember having a meet with them, and I think we stayed in um, the Cameron House down down in Aye. that time. And I went to see them on the Friday, and uh, before he picked the team, and I said to him, listen, don't play me. If you're thinking about playing me, don't play me. Because I'm not playing well. Play Martin B. Cost and Craig, because these lads have been playing well with these lads. I said, I ain't playing. So if you're thinking about playing me, don't play me. And uh, he went, well, let me think about it. And I said, no, I'm, I want to make a decision for you. Don't, I'm not playing well enough to play in your team. But let it go. And he did. He put me on the bench. And I played about three and a half seconds of that game or whatever it was. And, and the lads done the done the job. But I knew I would, I would find my feet. It was just... But I knew the challenge of Rangers was there, but the, the pressure never really, really got to me because I, I was an outsider coming into it. Whereas the lads were there before knew exactly what what it was like the year before or the year before where, where Rangers were winning and winning. All we had to do was I keep. And Simon probably said, I, "I think we only made a 15, 16 lads that, that could have performed that season. We didn't have a big squad compared to what Rangers had. We just had to keep everybody fit. And once we done that, I thought we were a right good side." Yeah, I mean, that game, that's a personal sacrifice I wasn't aware of, Paul, but... Um, I wasn't aware, by the way, I wasn't aware of that as well. Yeah, I'm not sure. Great, Simon, uh, you were on the bench there as well. Did you go to... I, you know, you well, you, you, no, no, I never... I was desperate to play. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, my, my story for that one is, uh, it's a wee bit different as well, but I'd started the season again through a wee bit of default because we were playing Tyrrell in Europe and Darren Jackson took on well. We were coming up from, it might have been Cameron House again, we were coming up on the bus, and he took on well. He was starting the game. Subsequently, Vim came up to me and the bus says, listen, Darren is not well, you're going to start. I came in and I scored two that night, and I scored a penalty. So automatically, I'm on the penalties. Anyway, fast forward to the week before that cup final, we were playing Dundee United again. And Vim took me in and he says, listen, happy with what you've been doing, but I'm going to give you a rest today. I'm going to play Andy Tom. He needs some game time. We're going to rest you. Uh, so I'm thinking, right, that's fine. We get a penalty in that game early on. And I remember sitting on the bench thinking, I'm on the penalties. I'd have been taking that. Andy, I think, scored the penalty. I think he got two that day and he had a great game <laughs> and started the final the next week. So it, it's just the way some things go in football. I'd been in good form. He decided to take me out and rest me, and Andy started the game the following week. You know, when you look at that final, Simon, I heard a lot of chat last season, you know, with uh, Ange Postecoglou coming in. His last managerial post had been in Japan, similar to, to Vim Janssen. 
There was yeah. a League Cup win. It seemed to galvanise the side a bit. Did, did you see any kind of similarities or comparisons between the two campaigns last season when, when Ange came in? I did. I did, I. Even, even the start. Even mm. the start when he comes in at Ten Castle and he gets beat. We, we had the two games, Easter Road, and then we get beat against them Fairland. To start the season with no points, with a new manager, all these new players coming in. I keep saying this should be a film, this particular one season. Now, now we're, we're obviously doing it as a, a show at the end of or the middle of May, but it's it's a remarkable story. And I did last year as it was unfolding, you could see all the similar similarities. Mm. Thankfully, uh, I'm just stuck about because as we know, Vim was there and he had his reasons. And, and unfortunately for us, he moved on straight after that season. Yeah. I mean, looking at his career as well, Paul, um, obviously he had played against Celtic in the 1970 European Cup final. He had appeared in two World Cup finals for the Netherlands. Was there anything he could do as a former midfielder uh, to tap into your own psyche and assist you as a coach as well, Paul? Again, Simon will tell you, he was really calm. Vim. He never, I mean, I can't remember him ever raising his voice at anything, you know, and he, he put it in a way, I think Simon said there, he, he told me about no playing. I, I always remember him saying, in God rest him, Phil O'Donnell. He walked by Phil O'Donnell in the corridor one day before he named the team. This says, says to him, you're not playing today, Phil, do you understand? And walked by him. And Phil was starting for words if they say, what do you say to that? But there's no, there's no comeback to that. And I always think when you, when a manager comes in, especially the level he played at, and, and, and when you read his... his what he's done in his game or what he did it's actually and I only really noticed this maybe a few months ago what Vim Janssen has won and what he's done as a player is extraordinary with, with the titles and, the, and World Cup things and things like that and I always think if Johan Cruyff turned around and said he wouldn't have been the same player if Vim Janssen never played behind him he must have been some player but you never thought that the way he went about it, Simon. He, he, he thought he you was... know, it was so, it, it was so, so yeah. humble and yeah. the humility. He never ever. There was one time I don't know if you remember. There was one time, and I wish I could remember who it was. He was getting a wee bit above their station at training. But from I don't know if it was maybe before you arrived. But we're up at Barrafield, and I don't know who it was. I wish I could remember. And he just turned around and says, when you've played in two World Cup finals, maybe you can come back and speak to it. It was a perfect, it was a perfect put down. But yeah. he said it in a way, you know, we're all decking ourselves, laughing. But that was the only time that you ever, I ever heard him refer back to his own career, you know. No. And we were, we were, we were, we were ignorant to an extent when he came in. Because there'd been other names uh, linked with the club and Vim Janssen came in. But then when you do strip it back, as Lambo says there, and I've read bits of his book since as well, this guy was a top operator. You know, he played in two World Cup finals. He went the final to the European Cup. He was a top, top player. But just his manner, and as, as Lambo says there, very calm. And probably somebody that we, we needed in that real pressure yeah. cooker of, of 97, 98. Mm -hmm. he, he said, the only thing he really ever said to me, he said, if you see something on the pitch, change it. He said, I won't, I won't have a, a word with you after it if you don't change it. And I've told you. That's the only thing he ever said to me, really, before before yeah. a game. He said, you're on the field. If you see something, don't look over to me. And I think, you change it because you can see it. And I, I thought, bloody hell, that's a... I always thought if I'd never done it, he would question his end say, why did you not change it? Said, that yeah. and that, that, to me, that was a secret of him. But really, just touched on how, how calm he was. And Simon said that. Would it have happened to any other manager? It's a real difficult question. That he, he's probably no many many could have done that ten in a row and stopped that. But he's mm -hmm. definitely up there with the best of them. Yeah, for sure. W when did it click for you then, Paul? You said that things weren't going so well at the, at the, the beginning mm -hmm. of your Celtic yeah. career. When did you feel right? I'm on it, and and it's clicked in for you. I think it took me a good a good month. I think just before the Rangers game, I was starting to find my kind of feet, the, the one we beat them 2-0 at, at Parkhead, that, that's when I was starting to kind of get a grip at the, of it, but I knew the, that game, where the craze goal had, had won that game for us, that was that was enough, all we had to do was try and beat them, and it pulled them back into the into your fight really, because Hearts were still hovering about at that time, weren't they? Hearts were still yeah. Hearts were a good team at that, yeah. at that point, so, but to pull Rangers back in was, 
was going to be a big one for us. And that, that was a game, I think, if Craig had scored and made it 1-0, then great, you take the points and then you, you go out. Because I think the week after that, we drew at Motherwell uh, the week after that. So I, I think then it was about a month before I started to find my feet of the magnitude here is going to be be massive, actually, if we can get this, if we can win this, really. Yeah, a lot of people talk about that game as being the sort of turning point of the season, the, the the point where a lot of people think, right, we can do this, we can we can really stop the ten, we can win the one. For you guys, when did it start to kind of hit on you that do you know what they've had a good start of the season, but we're starting to click, we're starting to get into this, and we can really do it. I think. Oh, you I, I was there just saying, I think they did not beat us at Ibrox two 0 after that game, yeah, I mean, they beat us two uh, 0 uh, We always knew it was going to be nip and tuck the way we were going. As Sam touched on it, there we, we had a really good side. All we had to do was keep keep everybody kind of fit <clears throat> at that point. Uh, and for some strange reason, we'd done it with a good magic to keep us calm on it with good good guys. I thought we, do you know, what, one of the most things I, th- I thought we were a really strong dressing room. I mean, talk about dressing rooms now, whether people single people out, but we had that wee bit of nasty streak in there. I think that people could single each other out, but you'd always be behind your mates back. And for me, I always thought the team spirit was going to be a massive thing for us because I think everybody got on. Do you know what? I wouldn't, I, I, I mean, unless Simon can go against it, I think everybody got on really well in that dressing room. I'm know, just I about to say, I, I, it was the tight, in my yeah. opinion, it was the tightest dressing room I was in that period. Yeah. You know, there, there was boys that had already experienced Celtic, uh, and then there was guys like Lambo coming in. Uh, I think there was seven or eight new guys came in, but yeah. there was a few of the Scottish boys that knew each other from the international setup. It was for, for me, you look back in football because it's ships passing the night at times in yeah. dressing rooms, but... I've got a lot of pals still from that dressing room and, and I think that was the tightest yeah. one that I've, I was in in my career. The, the, the big thing for me, sorry, just for button in there, is, is uh, obviously I came back from Germany and Simon said a lot of foreign lads and Simon will tell you, their Christmas night suit, that, that first one, I'd never seen anything like that. I went, Jesus, this is, this is mayhem. And then you see all the foreign lads dressed up as a panda or whatever it is and you think, Jesus, these guys must be like, oh, what the hell's going on here? But they quickly, quickly integrated with it. Mm-hmm. And that, that was the secret to it, and it was it was a really tight, it was really a really tight dressing room. That we had very good. I mean, it's it is on the lunchtime, so I don't know if there's many stories you can tell from that night out, Paul. Maybe, <laughs> no, at the, no. maybe, maybe at the night that we're having in May, but yeah, what was it? Seriously, <laughs> uh-huh. save them for May, save them for nine o'clock. Yeah. Keep, keep that one a secret. That just, one, just one remember, one. we're before the watershed here, but um, <laughs> no, it's obviously you're saying it's, it's a tight dressing room. You can actually see that now with the current Celtic team. You see with Callum being the leader, even guys like Greg Taylor stepping up over the last couple of months, integrating a lot of the foreign players that you're speaking about. It is quite scary how much there is similarities between the team of 97, 98 and the current team. And you, you kind of wonder how much of that success this time round is down to the manager as much as it was Wim. And you wonder if Wim had stayed on, and there wasn't Dr. Joe and there wasn't that sort of period where Rangers continued to outspend. What do you think that team under Wim could have went on to achieve? I think if Wim had stayed the way probably Angie's doing it and now he's tapped into the, the, the Asian market and all the lads have done brilliant. I mean, I don't know if the lads can speak English or, or they understand it, whatever, or they, they, but they, the good thing is about them, they, they've got a few that, that know each other, that they can lean on. Plus, they'll have the the Scottish lads or, or the British lads that they can they can hang on to things with. We we had it. We uh, Reggie was there, Henrik was there, Big Reaper was there. Uh, I'm trying to think who else came in at that point. Uh, and Nico and Noni was there. Obviously, Nico was still there. Yeah, yeah. Was still there. So, the, and the foreign lads really really took to it. Where I think the Scottish lads. It, they had that little bit of steel and nastiness in them to, to help them. They gave us a wee magic gold dust. And Simon touched on it there. Listen, Simon could score. Don't 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 think for one minute he could not get us a goal or, or Henrik or Harold Backpack or whatever. And, and when you look at that, you think, dear, dear, we, we have got power up front. We just had, as Simon said there, I think the, the defensive side there was probably a rock behind us. And we had Gildy 
who I know it take, it takes a ribbon at times, but he, he, he played some really good games for us and, and done done great for us. So defensively, we were we were strong. Reaper, Reaper would would kick the ball. I mean, any rose head and think that was that job done. You look back on it, it was and Stubbs beside him was was excellent. So yeah. and then Miko played in the game against Rangers. I remember the two 0 game. I know he was absolutely fantastic that mm-hmm. night because he man Mark Lauder. And he never gave him an absolute kick of the ball. That, that for me was the key to the yeah. game was Anoni against Lauder because he was outstanding yeah. Anoni. Yeah, for sure. I remember uh, getting the opportunity to ask him about that, Paul. And he says that because he'd played in Serie A, he had marked Brian Lauder's mm. brother. He says, and if you could mark his brother, you could mark Brian. Yeah, uh, because point. obviously <laughs> uh, he was a world-class player. But yeah. Simon, I've, I've spoke to you before about some of the influences that you, you took from... Uh, people coming from overseas, like Pierre Van Hooydonk, for example, you've previously said that was kind of like a bit of a game changer uh, in the dressing room on a training pitch. And yeah. we've been talking about it over the last 18 months, about the influence of the Japanese players coming at the Celtic and how that can rub off on their teammates. Uh, was it a wee bit like that with the likes of Henrik Larsson, for example, some of the Scandinavian boys that came in at Celtic? Did you learn a lot? What, what kind of things did they bring to the dressing room? Just extra quality extra quality. I look back in my time at Celtic, I was near 92 to 99 and within that time thankfully we won, I won a league uh, Lambo obviously went on to more success after I, I left but I look back and I, I look at playing the guys like Lambo, Paul McStay Lubo Moravchik, Henrik Larson, Pierre Van Hoy. these are guys that when people look back I mean arguably Henrik's and Lubo would be in the top Celtic team, you know. Lubo we got far too late in his career. Think of if we got him early. Uh, so I just look back and how fortunate I was to play the guys of that calibre. But what they brought to the team was how they went about their business. I was a young lad in the team when Pierre came in and watching him working on his game afterwards. Andy Tom coming in. Paul will tell you, like, working day in, day out with players, you, you learn little bits off them, you watch how they go about their business Henrik was the same uh, so you can't I think if you're not picking things up off these guys, you're doing something wrong yourself You know, I always looked to other players and tried to take things from their game and they just, as I say, that, that initial team brought us closer to Rangers and then when the likes of Lambo and the guys came in and Henrik, that was the team that found thankfully got us over the line and, and stopped, you know, them going for the 10. Uh, but it was a process and it was a, it's a process I'm really, when I look back now at 48, I'm thinking I played with some right good players, you know, I've been really lucky and fortunate to do that in my Celtic career. Mm-hmm. The amount of people that actually were shocked there when you said you're 48, Simon. <laughs> <laughs> well, as he said, as the man there said, it waits for nobody, so yeah. A lot greyer now, and I'm wearing these glasses, so definitely for it. Paul, you mentioned Jonathan Gould. I sometimes think about uh, Gould as being one of the kind of unsung heroes of that side. You know, guys mm. like Reaper, like you say, they go about their business, but they're they're really pivotal. Um, and I think special mention to somebody like Murdo McLeod, who mm. you know he pro- he was there when when Vim Jansen came in. I think he took some of the first preseason training. Simon, of him, of him, right? Yeah, he did. Um, yeah, he did. And he knows the club, he's played for the club. How important was he, Paul, uh, throughout that season for Vim Janssen? He'd it, it, have been a, a cornerstone to him just because I think Vim coming over and, and from Japan and not really knowing what things were, what were going to be really like. So Murdo must have became a great a great ally to him. I think people, I think Simon can correct me if I'm wrong here, I think David Hay was still at the club as well. Was that right, Simon? David yeah. and Andy Richard, who were... Celtic through and through, so they, they knew exactly what, what the club was losing. I think I think I just came in and Paul Paul McStay was retiring. I think Paul was leaving and Granity was leaving. That was two two stalwarts, I thought, either midfield. It's a massive chunk to lose at your team, especially McStay, because I thought he was he's arguably probably geez, in the top midfield that Celtic's ever had. So when you, when you look at that, it was a big chunk, but and Vim would have had to lean in Murdo a lot to think, well, who can we get in here? And assess the current guys that are already there, because he knew the challenge was, would have been a 10 in a row, and how do we stop it? 
How do we how do we stop this? It doesn't matter. You could bring in anybody, the pressure would have still been would have still been there. But I think the murder would have been a, a pivotal ally to him without a shadow of a doubt. Yeah. You spoke about McStay uh, retiring there, Paul. There's a lot of times when Celtic have heroes and legends at the, the, the team um, and they leave or they, they retire and they move on. Someone comes in to replace them and immediately there's that comparison. Oh, they're not as good as this person. They're not as good as that person. Did you ever feel the pressure to come in to replace Paul McStay in that team? Because a lot of people would have looked at that to say, well, we've brought in a Champions League winner here or a European Cup winner at that point. Um, and obviously the legend that is Paul McStay. Was that the pressure? you Did that sort of build into that period where you were saying that it took you a bit of time to settle? No, no, I never I never felt, um, it, it, without being big-headed, I, I came for a club that was unbelievable. I, I played with Pablo Sosa in the middle of the pitch, Andy Mola, guys that had won World Cups and things like that. I, no, I, I never felt in, in fear in that to anybody or who I was playing against, or I never really bored. Paul, I, I had the greatest respect for Paul McStay. He, he, even when I played against him, it's like Murn always knew if you stopped McStay, you would stop Celtic playing, in my opinion, at that, that era. And the, when I look at Paul's career at Celtic, could he have moved 100%, could he have done it abroad or 100%? Good players can play in any, any environment. So when I, when I came there, I never felt any pressure that Paul McStay had retired and, and anything like that. What I did know was he was a hell of a player. And when we won it, um, he came into the dressing room when we won it. And I was just sitting there. With a, I think I was smoking a cigar at the time. And, and, he, <laughs> just came and, he, and he, he walked in, he shook my hand and he went, well done. And then I've written great and all that. And that's the only real time I really kind of spoke to Paul at, at that at that time, so maybe he saw the similarity of him going out and me going in, but I never ever felt the pressure of I have to replace Paul McStay, but to lose Grant and McStay I think was huge especially Paul, because I think if you stop, Simon probably tell you better, I, I think if you stop McStay playing, you more or less stop the, the Celtic cog ticking, because he was a major part of it, I think how good they were Yeah, for sure um, See when you uh, hear the name Simon Craig Falkenbridge. What <laughs> memories does that bring back for you? <laughs> a, a little wry grin there. Yeah, uh, sometimes wake up in the middle of the night thinking about his name. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, just listen, that would have been from a personal point of view, obviously, East End Park the week before. I think it was the first time it was in our hands. Rangers had slipped up against Kilmarmock uh, and we were playing the following day. And yeah, it just wasn't to be, you know, with what, 10, 15 minutes left. It did, you know, cross my mind that my goal was going to take us over the line. But uh, you then looked to the scenes the following week, you know, albeit it was a hell of a week in terms of we wanted the game the next day, you know, after we slipped up against them filming, the boys wanted to just go out and play St. Johnson the, the following day. We had to wait a week. And then the St. Johnson game wasn't playing sailing. You know, we got off to a great start, but I watched it back in, in lockdown when all the games were on and we look nervy as the game goes on because I think everybody's aware of the result elsewhere. And you know at 1-0, anything can happen. So the relief for everybody, obviously, when Harold scores uh, in the scenes the, the following week. So from a personal point of view, I know what you're saying with Falkenbridge. Maybe we can invite him on May the 12th. <laughs> <laughs> Have a cut, cut of words with him. <laughs> Aye, definitely. <laughs> I think said so, if there's someone else that could be invited on uh, May the twelfth, Sergio Perini probably deserved a winner's medal for his contribution to the Celtic cause that season. With uh, Negri. With Negri, yeah. <laughs> oh, right enough. Aye, with the squash. With the um, one anyway. The anyway. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Paul, you know you you said before you've shared dressing rooms with these guys that obviously you, uh, you know have won World Cups and yeah. you've you've won a European Cup. When it gets to that point, as a fan, I often think about. The dressing room before that game against St. Johnson. I mean, as a fan, you're nervous enough. But in that dressing room, who who's the leaders? Who are you looking to? Or is it quite easy to look around and say, right, I've got Henrik, Henrik Larson sitting there, you know, and you can go into a game like that fully confidence. Um, because as a fan, I sometimes wonder um, how you're able to deal with that level of pressure. I, that was a beauty about that, that dressing room. I think every one of you is 
Uh, if you look at the team, I, I can't remember off the top of my head. I've known most of the guys, but most of the guys are international players. They, they've played in big games. They know how to handle big games. It, I never felt any pressure where I think, oh, this, this is going to be ridiculous here and he's nervous and he's nervous. Everybody knew how to, how to win games. Yeah, the game itself wasn't great. The St. Johnston won, Henry gets his up. But the training, I always tell us, I don't sign the members, Vim sent us home on a Thursday because training we were that bad in training. You know, lads were arguing with each other and it was getting a bit heated and, and, and Vim just says, right, blow his whistle and he says, right, on his goal, just go home. And I'll see you Friday. And he sent us home after about 20 minutes of training. I'll never forget that. And uh, he sent us home because it was terrible. Training was terrible. And uh, as I said, lads want to stick one on each other and things like that. So the pressure starting to go there. But I knew coming Saturday, the, the big players would step up. To, and, and the, most, the, the, most I most always thought that dressing room managed itself. We had, uh, we had Boydie, who, Boydie, who was a great skipper. Yeah. But as Lambo says, I mean, I was one of the younger lads in the, in the dressing room. I was maybe 23 at the time. But we'd, we'd senior, good senior pros, yeah. with good European experience in the dressing room as well. We just knew our jobs. Everybody yeah. seemed to know their jobs. And I think the influence and the calmness of them, I don't remember anybody really having to rally us before game. We just knew what was required. Uh, and as I said, training could get heated uh, at times, but it was just, you were in addition to the, the guys that wanted to win. And I think it just managed itself. Yeah, well, that's exactly that. There's a team, team of winners. That 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 was a so see they, that could that could go totally totally with, with most of them because physically they could handle it and mentally I think they could handle the the big occasions. If, if you ask Simon, Vim, I, mean, I can't remember Simon. Vim, Vim would never say to us we're going to do shape play or anything like that. We all knew where to go. We all knew where yeah. to go. And even even to this day, if you said to Simon, "Go and play centre forward," "Go and play outside right," or whatever, "Go and play left back," you could do it. Because game intelligence is so important for everybody. There are some players you, you virtually have to put them stand, start, stand, start. You stand here, you stand here. That dressing room, no, everybody knew their job. Yeah, yeah. Simon, I'm going to come to you on this one uh, to start with because obviously you've got the elation. Um, Ten years since we won a league, uh, you, you managed to get it over the line. Did you see what was to come? Did you think there was any issue between Vim Janssen? I know there was stuff in the press about him being unhappy with the, the GM at the time. Um, but when that announcement was made in the dressing room, was that a complete surprise, a complete shock to you over in Lisbon? Complete shock to me. I, th- I think maybe, I-, I think we were in Lambo's room when, when the news broke. Uh, you might be able to correct me if my memory's uh, serving me wrong. I think we all had congregated in a room to be told the news and you know, as a young guy, just we just won the league. I, I couldn't believe it. I think maybe senior players, maybe had, I don't know if Lambo maybe had conversation with them or, or Tom Boyd as captain. But I, I never seen it coming. I never seen it coming. Uh, and obviously, since I've heard things, you know, he had his reasons. Uh, but no, at the time, you were like, "What is going on?" It was it was a total surprise. Is that your yeah. memories as well, Paul? I remember, I remember him getting us in the room and, and telling us that was his last, his last trip. I roughly knew there was things going on behind the scenes with him because he was quite, he was quite good with me. He's quite outgoing. I remember the, the, because the two was playing the same kind of position, the same kind of way that he, he kind of leaned on me a little bit with, with certain things. But I knew there was major issues of it, and I thought, I, I says, I, this is no why you, you sign for a club for one year to break up and 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 go. It's, uh, different ways and the time you think everybody becomes disillusioned and you think I, I don't want to stay here because the manager's away and he signed me and then you've got to go for scratch and then it'll give Rangers impetus again to go to mm-hmm. kick on again which which they did and it, and it put us in the back foot again and, and until the early 2000s it put us in the back foot but that shouldn't take away what Vim Janssen and, and the lads had done the team had done because as I said before if you you strip it right back, what they done it. It was nigh on on a miracle how they done it. Nigh on a miracle because the Rangers team was that that strong and that winning mentality. And that they, they that they that they, they, Rangers had the eye of the tiger really. They were just bulldozing everything. Mm-hmm. What we had to do was get that hunger back from them. And that 97 team, 98 team certainly had it. Ah, that's for sure. 
so it's 25 years, guys, since the 97, 98, starting the 10. It's also 20 years since we got to the EFA Cup final in Seville this year. Paul, you played in both of those teams. Was there many similarities? And if you had to put them side by side, which was the better team? Oh. <clears throat> similarities, yeah, 100%, because they had nastiness. And, and yeah, physically... If you look at all the, if you look at the two thousand era, even the Albi and, and the, the Baldi and, and Voharan were absolutely mountains of players. But you flip it and you look at Arnone, Stubbs, Reaper. There's, geez, you can throw you can throw a blanket of that that back lot because they all had great attributes and they all had that that nasty streak. So I even touched on it. They're training. We trained the way we played. Mm-hmm. Same in the two thousands. We, we trained the way they, if you train like a beast, you'll play like one, and they, that, that's the way we've done it. And the the similarities are there because they the hunger and the fire and the belly. Without that, you cannot play the game. And, and the both sets of eras had that. I think it's a really un, it's a very unfair comparison to try and compare the nineties team to the two thousands team that I played. But all the two, I get asked that question all the time about what do you think of the guys in this era? Could you play in your era? Good players can play in every era, but you can never compare because it, there's a different era. But good players and you can play in different eras. But the, the, 90, the 97, 98 team, would, would Simon Donnelly get into Martin Neal's team? 100%. 100% that's that's the, no a question. So, the, the, yeah, the, the, oh, so, <laughs> you the two of them are placed. Put, you, put you on the spot, and it? It's a different <laughs> two, great, two great teams, two great eras that I was fortunate enough to play with. Simon, I'm going to ask you a wee question here. I was watching Paul's uh, pile driver against Rangers in the 2-0 game uh, during the week there, and it's the that moment where the ball bursts in it, and it's just that instant elation in the in the crowd. It's it's what you love football for. You do a lot of commentary. Uh, we hear you on Celtic TV and, and elsewhere. Um, if that happened today, you'd need to wait for the decision. What's your thoughts on that? I, I know we can't get through a bulletin without mentioning VAR, but it's got to get better, Simon, isn't it? It's got to get better. It frustrates the life out of me. I cover the Celtic games just now, and I know every goal has to be checked, but not to the extent of three, four minutes. And we've got the advantage of screens in the studio, which some, normally when you, you look at it, you can tell in five seconds. And it's taken three, four minutes, and we've got fans outside looking in, and it's, it's taken something away from the fans' experience. That goal that you're talking about with Lambo. They would have stripped it back to something, two moves before, you know, trying to look at a foul or something. It just, it's taking something away from the game. I get that they're trying to get decisions more accurate, but it's, it's, Kyogo scored two goals recently and he, he, he couldn't celebrate them properly because they had to strip it back. The guy plays on the edge, he plays on the shoulder of defenders, but the goals were onside. But because it takes so long for VAR to come up with the answer, he can't celebrate properly. It just it, it has to change in some form. I, I know they're talking about bringing in explanation, and you know you can hear the yeah. referee. But I just wonder does that is that just going to add time on as well? It takes something away from the spont- spontaneity of, of football for me. Yeah, for sure. Mm-hmm. We've got a, we've got a question coming in actually from one of the viewers, Paul. This one's from a, an Axom contributor, Laura Bradburn, who would have loved to have been here today. Yeah. Afternoon, lads. Question for Paul: Thoughts on Aaron Moy? Paul himself knows what it's like to have a French superstar in his back pocket. I think we all know who they're talking about there in the European Cup final. Um, what a season Aaron Moy's having, Paul. I think. Um, listen, I think Celtic midfield is really good, and I think he's got incredible options there. The manager way. way um, with the lads, I think Callum's obviously a stick on it. He seems to play all the time. Hattati seems to play all the time. <coughs> and you've got O'Reilly and Moy and Tumbo and another lad that just signed. So they've got a really good strength and balance in the midfield. He, 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 he does some great things, Aaron Moy. I think he's a really good World Cup anyway. I think he just took that form back to Celtic, which is which is great. But he, he's always been a good player because he was good down at Huddersfield. He was a really good time down, down this neck. Um, and it was just him probably finding his feet what Celtic's like. So he's um no he's a, listen, a really good good footballer where but he's, I think he plays with really good players in the middle of the pitch for him, which will make it make it easier for him. Yeah. 
Paul, it's been a, a wee while since we last spoke and um, we last spoke, we thought about management and it's been a, a while now since you've had a managerial job. There's jobs opening up in Scotland, like the Aberdeen job, and I mean, Dwight York is putting himself forward for it. And um, I don't think his coaching credentials quite are anywhere near the standard of yours. If you were given the opportunity, would you come back into management in Scotland? Listen, I'm, I'm happy. With, I'm, I'm doing. I'm doing a lot of stuff down down south at the minute, which I really, I really enjoy. Uh, I've had the opportunity to go back in down here, which I've said no. I've had some things abroad, which uh, I, wasn't right for me at the minute. So no, at the minute I'm I'm happy where I am. I'm not one of the ones I'm going to put myself and shout to the rooftops. I want that job or that job. No, I'm happy. Uh, the if something comes up and I think it's worthwhile, then I'll go and I'll go and look at it. I've got a wee question for the Perrys. It's on the, the subject of uh, European football. And, you know, I'm not taking anything for granted, but obviously Ange is doing so well domestically and we always look ahead to uh, the European campaigns. Simon, there was a, a a tie against Liverpool in that 97-98 season that I think it showed your quality as a team. You know, the two each game, the nothing each game. Um, and Ange must have one eye on European progression from what you've seen so far, do you think it's something that we can progress in? Uh, I mean, I, I was I was pretty happy with some of the performances in the Champions League this season. We didn't get the results we wanted, Simon. <clears> but what's your yeah. take on that? Do you think it's something we can improve on next season? I think so. I think that's part of uh, Angie's project as well. I think he said that he wants to establish himself in the Champions League. But it's, it's easier said than done. You know, with the finances round about, Football these days, you go back to Lambo's team of the 2000s. You know, Mark O'Neill's team, I thought, came really close to doing. I know they got to the, the final year for Cup Top, but in the Champions League, they came really close to, I think, getting into the knockout stages with that team where I had it last at the top of his game. Who knows where they could have went? I think the challenge for, for Ange now is to keep moving forward with the team. His recruitment has been brilliant up until now, you know, really exciting. I covered the Real Madrid game for 60, you can argue, yeah, 3-0 Real Madrid, but for 60 minutes Celtic really played, they went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Real Madrid. Uh, but it's difficult because these guys are, are world-class. Uh, but the, again, the Celtic fans appreciate it and they're all standing at the end because they, they accept that there is a way to, to get beat, if you like. I'm just interested to see what, where he goes next and brings in recruitment and can get closer. I like the way he goes about his business. I don't want Celtic to go and be behind the ball and, and be, you know, trying to get a nil-nil or whatever. I like the way he goes about it. He backs himself to go and attack and try and score goals, which they have done. And hopefully they get stronger as, as, as a defensive unit. Uh, but it's really difficult. As I say, they're, they're fighting. It's no fire with fire. You know, they're fighting, you know, with, the finances that the European teams have got, it's, it's not a, a level playing field. Yeah, for sure. Paul, you won the gong, you won the European Cup uh, with Borussia Dortmund and Ange has spoken about ambitions and aspirations. How do you think we could fare, uh, you know, moving into the next season with the development and the progression and maybe some new faces as well next year? I, I have Sam touched on it again. It, Martin O'Neill's team never qualified with nine points. Nine points now we don't need enough when you when you when you the group. Mm -hmm. Some teams can get through in six. So all you need is a wee bit of luck and a, and a couple of little results to go your way. And, and I agree with Simon. I saw some of the games and the lads done great. The club done great. He's right what he's saying there about the finances. You've got to compete. It's uh, it's David and Goliath really. Even though Celtic are a huge club, but if you give Celtic that same finance, then it'd be really interesting where they where they went with it. it. Everybody knows how the manager plays. The full-backs come in and, and they get the overloads and, they, and the two midfield lads go out wide and things like that. But top, top teams and top players, I think, can really hurt you in the wide areas because you're that exposed in the wide, the wide areas if they keep the two wingers high. But the manager doesn't go away for his belief in quite rightly so. But you've seen it in his face, he's disappointed. He never picked up any wins or any points in that or any significant wins in that. That group, the Champions League, you need a bit of a break somewhere. Whether you get a group, it maybe it's not as strong as what Celtic had the last time, and, and it's a group where you think, you know what, we can maybe get something there. But if Celtic can just keep picking up points in each game they play over there or in that in that section, then you've always got a chance 
when I won it, we had to qualify with 13 points because ourselves and Atletico Madrid finished on the same amount of points. The only difference being was Atletico Madrid beat us in goal difference. So we finished second and they finished obviously top. Then we had to go and play out there and, and then Manchester and then obviously the final. So you need that little bit of a break in there uh, with it at certain times. But when you really want to hit that level, a top, top European football, one, you've got to be so cute without the ball because you get runners wanting to go behind you and you can get tracked to the ball and guys drift off your back or somebody does a step over and fires into the top corner. You're playing against different animals when you leave your domestic league, as Simon knows, when you go into the European stage, you're playing against you're playing against top, top, top players where they might not be in the game for at least 30, 40 minutes and then all of a sudden, bang, it's a goal and you think, where's that came from? That That's the difference between the top ones and the the ones that aspire to be there, but they're not a million miles away for trying to get a group section. I think that's the next stage for the manager is to try and just, if you get at that group stage, then I think you'll get loads of plaudits because he's playing well enough. He just needs to go that extra yard with it. Whether he thinks new guys need to come in and help, I'm pretty sure he'll know who he thinks can, can help him. One yeah. of the things you, you mentioned, Paul, about the 97 team, the Seville team, was how they had that bit of nastiness about them. Mm. It sort of got them there. I think if you look at the, the Celtic team just now, <clears throat> there isn't really that nastiness about them. They're a very technically gifted side, very mm-hmm. skillful side. Do you think in the coming transfer window in the summer, especially ahead of Europe, that's something Anne should look to to try and have more success in Europe is to have someone like that? There's always been that sort of talk that we've never really replaced Scott Brown and what he could bring to the team. If things get nasty, he could get involved. Is that something we should maybe look at for the summer? Do you know what? I don't know because I don't know the Celtic dressing room. I don't know what they guys are like. They, they could be animals in there. I'm saying from my time and Simon's time in the 2000 era and, and even my time with, with Scotland or, the, or Dortmund, there was always arguments there in the dressing room at halftime or, or full time or whatever. It always that that's that's normal for for any team that wants to win. You, you, you've got to be, you have got to be a, a certain animal or a certain type of player that you can point the finger and think, right, okay, I'm going to take this on the chin or, or then we let it go because we're going to try and win the next game. The nice thing this, I mean, is, is people that will run through walls for you and, and you'll do the exact same for them and you'll be at his back, your mate's back. That's that's a sign of a really top side that, that have that. Celtic might have that, I don't know. And you're saying, obviously, you're saying there that they, they're really technical gifted. You'd like to think if the things wasn't going to address them, somebody would point the finger. If you think, because mm. that's how you win trophies. But Simon will tell you, you've got, to, you've got to have that nastiness to win trophies to to get that at times. And, and put it this way, if I was getting my backside felt on a pitch, I wouldn't want to stand thinking, oh, my mate's really nice to me, thinking, oh, it's all right, you'll be mm. fine. You'd expect somebody to kick you in the, the backside to, to give you one. So it's a real difficult question because I don't know the dress room from my time. 100% arguments and nastiness. Even though I was growing up as a 15-year-old, I saw fights in dressing rooms, which, which, uh, which were men, were crazy things. So, but would you get that now? Probably not. But the game's changed and, and people change. So, it's um, the Celtic guys have got the the nastiness because they know they have to win every week. They have to win whether they play Dundee United or whoever. It doesn't really matter. They have to win because that's the pressure about being a Celtic player. You have to win every single game you play. And that's, yeah. that's an sign of nastiness. Mm-hmm. For sure. That ruthlessness, I for sure. Um, the 12th of May, you guys are going to be at the Armadillo in Glasgow. Tickets are actually available on the link underneath this video. And we've been saying to you that two of the, the viewers are going to win two VIP uh, tickets to that particular night. Uh, Simon Donnelly, I don't know if we're going to have to wait until then to find out what the uh, Smell the Glove carry-on was about. Um, there seems to have been a few stories over the years. Are we going to have to wait until the Armadillo to find out the truth? Well, we've got the, the real story, obviously. Uh, it was created in our dressing room. But, uh, yeah, I'm thoroughly looking forward to the night. I think these these things don't come around. I remember uh, us celebrating 10 years anniversary, which is absolutely mind-blowing. We're now going for the 25th, but it's brilliant because you are at ships in the night, you know, in dressing rooms, you know, when you go to a different club, it's a great 
reason for us all to get back together. It's a special, special season in the in the club's history. So it'll be great to get uh, the fans there and, and see the boys. And I'm thoroughly looking forward to it. Yeah, for sure. Um, our friends at, at First Star have given us a couple of VIPs, so all you need to do, keep watching the channel, subscribe to the channel, and if you want to buy tickets and see Simon Paul and some other guys pay tribute uh, to the late, great Vim Janssen, then the ticket link is underneath this video. Uh, Simon Paul, it's been an absolute pleasure. It always is a pleasure to speak to you guys about your Celtic careers. Thanks for your time, and hopefully we'll see you on the 12th of May, guys. No problem, yes, guys. Thank you. Colin, what, what an absolute privilege it is to have Paul Lambert and Simon Donnelly join us on a Celtic State of Mind. Two great Celtic men, um, some great stories, and I'm sure there'll be more on the 12th of May. So if you haven't got your tickets already, as Paul said, it's in the description, get them now. I just wonder, I never get a chance to ask Paul there, I wonder if he'll bring a wee pool table along that night. Do you hear he's a bit of a pool shark? Well, I tell you, but it's, that's a great point. Um, you know how I'm working my way through the old Celtic videos and very slowly um, I'm doing the, the Axom Retro Video Club. One of them follows Paul Lambert about. Yep. I don't know if I you remember, remember that. Yeah. yeah. yeah and I he remember. goes in and, and then it's him and Larson playing pool and stuff like yeah. that as well. They actually showed that. Um, people remember it better than me. I was a bit younger, but Celtic played Livingston um, at home and the floodlights cut out. Mm -hmm. um, I think it might have been around December time uh, Livingston were 2-1 up at the time um, and the game obviously was paused whilst they put another 50p in the metre or whatever it was um, but on the big screen they showed that video um, and they showed the Paul picking up whoever it was he took to training and then playing Larson at the pool and yeah so I'd be interested to see if he'd, he'd bring that back and if memory serves me right Celtic won 3-2 that day with a goal and injury thing there you go. You've got a good memory, Colin. Look at this, Tony McCann, PJD. Stop with the soonest for sure impersonations. <laughs> Listen, at some point, someone's going to go through the archive of Axon episodes and pick out all the stuff that people continually say uh, that you're completely unaware of, Colin. And if that's one of mine, I wasn't aware of it until you you said that. Alan, absolutely, it's great to get the ex-Selks in on a show. Simon's been on a couple of times with yourself and me, uh, Colin. And yep. you've interviewed Paul Lambert as well. Yep. Um, and I just think, yeah, Vim the Tim, um, it's, it's a great time to look back on that season. You, of course, you were only three at that time, Colin. But, three when the season started, yeah. But that, that gave birth to someone, and Henrik Larson really, his Celtic career, that, who became like a staple part, like a legendary figure in your formative years supporting Celtic. But that was really his introduction to the Celtic fan base, a slightly different version of Henrik back then. Yeah, definitely. Um, I remember one of the first Celtic videos or DVDs that I'd got was the Henrik Larson, the boy who would be king. Mm -hmm. um, and it was like my first look back at that season um, because YouTube wasn't around back then and um, it was, it was kind of difficult to get a hold of stuff. Um, and I remember watching that and going, how could you have such a terrible start and then going to be such a legend? Chick Charlie, that's your, I mean, they were talking about giving Chick Charlie a Scotland cap at that point. That was the, the way things were going, but um, it's incredible. And I remember um, when Wim passed away about a year ago, we uh, there was a sort of memorial um, memories of that period that was put together by, um, <clears throat> I think it was the Celts are here, um, and they asked me to be on it. And one of the things I remember back from that was when I was in school, there was a book released um, and it was a book all about that season. Mm -hmm. So that's how I've got the memories of Marco Negri and Perini and uh, Dunfermline and Dundee United done pretty well that season as well. St Johnston were doing quite well. They were going for Europe on the same day that they played us. Um, and I found it on eBay a couple of months ago and it's only £1.25 and I'm pretty sure that the sort of brick and brack at the primary school fet that I bought it at it was about £1.25 so um, good to see that it's holding its value throughout these years. Oh absolutely but the, the, the team, the third force that season was Hearts and I find it interesting that back then I, I already said Rangers had spent 14.5 million quid in the summer. I think the three Italians came in, Amoruso, Negri and, and Perini two that you've already mentioned but they were spending big money Celtic were spending money in a different way 
What was that? Sorry, I, was just, I was just making sure to caveat that was money that they didn't have. Yes, yeah. And Celtic were spending money. I mean, Burley, two and a half million quid. You know, Reggie Blinker was a trade uh, between Sheffield Wednesday and obviously Paolo Di Canio went in the other direction. But we bring in Harold Bratt back for a couple of million pounds, Mark Reaper for one and a half. And, you know, obviously the, the bargain of the century with Henrik Larson, 650 grand. We bring in Darren Jackson, Stephen Mahe, Jonathan Gould. So there was big spending clubs in Celtic and Rangers at that time, but Hearts still competed. They tailed off near the end of the season, Colin. But I find it interesting now that a lot of the talk coming out of Tynecastle was that they want to compete with Celtic and Rangers. I mean, mm -hmm. um, is that something... I, I think you've all, always got to take any competition seriously, but is that something that you think is possible from a team like Hearts? I, I don't see why not. I mean, you look at Edinburgh, obviously... Big, one of the biggest cities in Scotland. Um, they've got a good fan base there. I think if they were ever to expand Tyne Castle, they would probably sell quite a few more tickets. Um, they have this opportunity now. If they finish third, they're basically in a playoff for um, the Europa League, and and maybe not this season, maybe not next season. But if they can, if we continue doing well in Scotland and we continue to keep our reputation up. I don't see why they couldn't make it into the Europa League group stages um, and reinvest that money properly. They've got some good players Gee. there. Um, they for have sure. Good players there. Yeah. And, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> All it takes is one bad season. One bad season from either half of um, Glasgow and they could find themselves in the Champions League the way things are going just now. So I, I don't like this idea where other teams in Scotland say the gap's too big, the gap's too big. Work on it. Improve yourself. Yeah, yeah. I believe that. I do, Colin. And I've said it quite a lot of the time. Sometimes, you know, you go and you look at different clubs at different levels and you can see, and listen, they might just say, what do you know? You're not a you know, a CEO, you're not a GM. But a lot of the things I was seeing when I was looking at the um, situation, for example, that Dunfermline were in uh, 11 years ago now, and a lot of it seemed pretty obvious from the outside looking in that there was opportunities that weren't being capitalised on. And it's not always constantly going back to your, the same group of fans and asking for more money and more money. It is about slowly but surely expanding that fan base and doing it in a creative way. Uh, and I know that Alan Burrows, who's obviously made the, the move over to Aberdeen, Colin, he was working really hard and done some brilliant stuff at Motherwell, for example. That's a great move for Aberdeen. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think he'll totally rejuvenate them um, and they need it at the minute. By the way, fair play to you for throwing that grenade at Paul Lambert. You want the Aberdeen job, mate? Aye, ah, just, got, just throw that one in. I've got to try it. <laughs> um, make it a wee clip we can put on our shorts channel. Um, but no, I think with Burroughs coming in at Aberdeen, um, certainly what he done at Motherwell was tremendous. Mm -hmm. um, and I think but on a bigger budget, on a bigger scale... He can do a lot of good things up in Aberdeen. Aberdeen again, it's a the city potential. full of Arthur. It's a city of Arthur up there. They still get sixteen, seventeen thousand, but look at how many uh, seats they filled at the cup final at Celtic Park. So when they've got a successful team, the fans will turn up. So it's all about getting it right up there. They've got Dave Cormack who does want to put the money behind them. You've seen that with the money that Jim Goodwin spent this summer. They're another team that could be pushing for Europe, that could do well if they got a, a European run. Uh, They've done look, pretty well, Colin, with um, selling players as well. You know, yeah. when you think of uh, players like Ferguson, who I knew you were his biggest fan, Lewis Ferguson. I, I was a fan. I liked Lewis Ferguson. Um, they done well with, with McKenna, didn't they? Um, mm -hmm. And who was the young, the, the fullback? Calvin Ramsey as well. Calvin yeah. Ramsey, yeah. I mean, they have done a bit, a bit of good business as well with players coming in and being sold on. I think there's potential there. So uh, we'll keep an eye on that. I, I just want to bring in some of your comments. I appreciate that we normally bring in a lot more um, with obviously Paul Lambert and Simon being here today. It was a wee bit different setup, a different format. Studs Lanigan, great stuff there. Must watch again. Yeah, it was. It's uh, always an absolute pleasure to talk to anyone who pulled on the green and white hoops for, for real. Paul Andrew Martin, great win for Axon. That was magic well in. Um, I, I, I love the two different personalities between Simon and, and Paul as well. Well done. Two fantastic players and great guests. Thanks for tuning in, Keith uh, and Robert Highland. Nice surprise this afternoon, Axon. Two Celtic greats. Um, and I think he's talking about the ones who are no longer on the screen, <laughs> Colin, for sure. Uh, William Kennedy, sorry. 
I was going to say the thing with Paul is he's very. Um, you can tell he's very composed in front of the camera. Yes, he, he speaks very, very well. If anyone hasn't seen the interview that I did with him, what was that about eighteen months ago now for the that channel? Was, yeah, um, go and check that out because he talks really well about his former teammates, uh, guys like Stephen O'Donnell, um, talking about how they combat the sort of issues of mental health in football as well. So. <laughs> It's a, it's a really good eye-opening interview, um, and I recommend everyone go check it out. Not just because I'm in it, but Paul speaks really, really well. And while you're on the channel, um, subscribe, because we're going to be giving away a couple of VIP meet-and-greet meet and greet tickets, and it's on the, the 12th of May at the Armadillo. It's a tribute evening for the dearly departed Vim Janssen and that great side of 25 years ago. Um, and the organisers for Star have given us these VIP tickets this week. We're going to be giving away those tickets tomorrow to someone who subscribes to the channel, be that a new subscriber, someone who's been in here for years. Everybody's put in a pot and we'll draw the winning ticket out. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to have some more guests from that team. I'm not going to give you any names at this moment, Colin, but there might be another couple coming up over the next two weeks. Um, certainly, as well, certainly sweet would be lovely. That certainly would. If you want to buy tickets for the the uh, the super sweet and the rest of that team, underneath this video is a link. Click on the link, and that will take you to the Armadillo's uh, website. John Francis is asking where JP is today. Uh, the music man JP John is on music duty uh, <laughs> somewhere in the world. And he is with one of the bands that he works very, very closely with. But he will be back next week. And I felt gutted for him, actually, because I know that that today would have been right up his street with, with Simon Donnelly and Paul Lambert. I Ray Vaughan, Paul Lambert's tribute to him as well. Did you not see that? What was that? He had the jersey in the background. Did Paul they, oh, the that's right. Did. Was, was that a Bayern Munich one, by the way? It looked like it, it yeah. Bayern looked Munich, like yeah. Like it, yeah. Um, Ray Vaughan. Uh, if you know, you know. G PJD, any video for a watch list, something I've wanted to do for a while. Right, the, the situation with that is we've got every single VHS video that's ever been released on Celtic. It's known as a dead collection. There's never going to be another release on VHS. So we've got the whole collection. Um, and I would love to just, you know, burn them and stick them on the channel, but you're not allowed to do that for copyright reasons. Um, but what we can do is you're able to review them which allows you fair usage of the content as, as long as it's for review purposes. So what we're doing on the channel um, is one by one, we're going through every single one of these videos and we're reviewing them. There's a couple up there already. Um, but I've got to get my head around the editing software before I do another uh, batch of those, but I will get through every single one of them. And I've also got uh, literally hundreds of the old VHS tapes as well, taped off the telly. And there's a lot of content on there that, you know, even Lil Z on Twitter, for example, uh, hasn't posted in the past. It's not just goals. It's things like when um, Jack Anoski was doorstepped for his birthday and all that. Colin, this is before your time, but it's an mm -hmm. infamous it's an infamous piece of footage that you don't see that often. Or when Billy McNeil's getting interviewed after a Scottish Cup win against Rangers where Tommy Coyne had scored the winner and Terry Butcher kicks the door and walks past Big Billy and Iluke. Um, horror on Billy McNeil or fury on Billy McNeil's face. I've never seen it. It might be somewhere on YouTube, but we're going to start uh, utilising all that kind of content and getting it on the channel. So there is a there is a list. If you look at axom.net, which is our blog, um, I, I put a list on there some time ago. So even if you just type in VHS uh, Retro Video Club axom.net, there's a whole list of all the videos um, on there as well. Colin, it's been fantastic to speak to yourself and also to Paul Lambert uh, and Simon Donnelly. We'll be back at 12.30 tomorrow where there'll be another special guest on Axom. Thanks, everybody, for getting involved. And we'll see you at 12.30 tomorrow on A Celtic State of Mind. Take care.